Hello, thank you for joining us today for the January GRCOM, the Global Resilience Commission webinar series. This one is on electromagnetic pulse, understanding the risk, developing achievable, achievable resilience requirements. And my name is John Heltzel. I'm the Director for Resilience Planning for the Electric Infrastructure Security Council. We're very pleased that uh, you're joining us today. I think you're gonna be very uh, impressed with the speakers that we've lined up and the information that they're gonna provide. So we're gonna jump right into this to make the most use of your time. I will do a short welcome today and I wanna thank you all for showing up and welcome you from our president and CEO, Mr. Avi Schnur. Uh, we appreciate you all becoming part of our network and attending these sessions. Today, we're, we're very pleased to have Mr. Frank Koza as our facilitator and you, you'll receive briefings today from uh, Mr. David Dorfman, Davidson Scott, uh, Randy Horton, and Kevin Bryant. Quite a bit of information to provide. Let me jump ahead. We're very excited that we have a new partner uh, to the EIS Council and the GRCOM mission. Uh, Omni Threat Structures has come on board as one of our primary partners, and we're excited that they're going to be able to present some information in the forum session. Additionally, we're very excited to continue our relationship with Triton Defense. Triton is actually the sponsor for today's EMP session, and uh, we'll provide you some additional information in the forum and also the handouts. Uh, let me talk just a second as we move forward. The slides and the video links will come out after this presentation as soon as they're rendered, and in about a week, you can expect to get a set of notes uh, from the commission that covers most of the important topics. So feel free to put uh, any questions you've got into the question box uh, and use the chat feature. But primarily, we're going to look towards the uh, question box and try to address those, if not in this session, in the follow-on session. Let's talk a little bit about the vision that's driving GRCOM. We first got into this uh, concept and this, this thought of uh, based off what happened to the world with COVID-19. Uh, early on in uh, 2020, we saw that this, this idea of a new class of extreme hazards was actually going to continue to uh, stretch across the globe and cause us the kind of frictions we'd always talked about in the Electric Infrastructure Security Council work. Globalization and the risk that that brings to us and the given opportunity present challenges for us where we have to be able to uh, address issues in our business models, and make sure that we're changing things so that we can ensure the growth of human happiness, understanding, and our ability to come together as a globe to address these issues. Our vision is that with all of our resources living primarily within the private sector, we are hoping to harness both the work of the private sector and the public sector to build global scale resilience planning efforts. And GRCOM is our first implementation of this. What we set as a boundary for GRCOM was to focus primarily on implementable near-term resilience needs of the private sector. If we can address those up front holistically, we're gonna move things in the right direction. Implementable near-term, we're caging in our mind somewhere between uh, the 12 month to 24 month timeframe. Lots of resilience planning going on for the long duration, the 10 year plans. We wanna see if we can affect things in a shorter timeline. A few highlight points. We really think that there's a need to avoid the, the trap of fighting the last war. Uh, we, we are very good at all hazards planning, but a lot of issues with all hazards planning is we miss the things that are coming at us in a very evolving environment. Some of our most serious resilience gaps beat the business as usual solutions. At the council, we've always focused on the extreme black sky hazards, and you see them listed there. Black sky hazards are those that can bring an infrastructure to its knees, primarily starting around long duration power outages. But as COVID has shown us, not only that. There are a couple of black sky resilience gap categories that we want to call attention to. One of the ones is most difficult to, uh, to make progress on is this cross-sector multinational planning gaps. We first ran into this when we were providing some detailed planning scenarios for the UK, both in London and in Glasgow. And we had very high level uh, attendance that basically told us here are the issues that we're facing and what we saw with their issues were these require global solutions it's not something we could solve in one sector or one silo or even one nation hence the term global resilience commission restoration lifeline compatible restoration sperm supply chain fragility and the tools that we need called coast which are going to be optimized all sector tooling 
which makes the information available to improve our networks. And then we want to talk about the sector by sector internal planning gaps. And this has been an area that the council has worked on for nearly a decade. But what we're doing now through GRCOM is adding new tools to be able to support the work between the sectors and bring people together. And you'll get a chance to hear more about that a little bit later on. So in today's webinar, well, EMP is only one example, but it is a major example. We are not prepared for an EMP strike, as you'll hear today, but there are solutions that can be leveraged. And we've got some great panelists to talk about the work that's being done to better understand the threat, prepare for the threat, and then mitigate the threat if at all possible. We're bringing in some of the best minds and leaders from across the world. If you were able to, part, able to participate in any of the three webinars under GRCOM that we did in 2020, you know exactly what I'm talking about. World-class leaders, leaders from nation states, leaders from the top of their industry. Today is no example, no exception. I'm sure you're going to be excited by the, uh, the information that's going to be provided in our, our presenters. What we want to come out with, though, is the type of work that we're going to release today the world's first comprehensive peer-reviewed detailed EMP handbook. And I'll talk more about that at the end of this uh, session where I tell you how you can get it, but uh, we're very proud of this work and our foundation partners that made it possible. So uh, new products are gonna be released and we invite you to be part of us going forward as we build these products uh, and you're part of the solution that comes together. So really we want you to become part of our growing array of partners and I'll talk a little bit more about that at the conclusion of the session. But let's let's go ahead and get into our initial session. It's my pleasure to introduce the facilitator for today's session, Mr. Frank Coza. I've known Frank for several years now. He's an absolute uh, uh, critical source for information working in not only the electric sector, but the energy sector, and recently putting his arms around the critical infrastructure. And Frank will serve as our primary facilitator. Frank, I'll turn it over to you now. Okay, John, thanks very much. I want to welcome everyone to the session uh, today. Uh, as John mentioned, we've got four excellent speakers. We're going to lead off with David Dorfman. David Dorfman is Legislative Director and General Counsel for Congresswoman Yvette Clark of New York. You may or may not know, but uh, Congresswoman Clark has been involved with resilience issues and critical infrastructure protection for some time. So we're interested in getting David's perspectives on these topics from the perspective of Washington. So David, please take it away. Hey everyone. Well, look, thank you guys for the kind introduction. It is such an honor to be here today. Really uh, appreciate everyone taking the time to join this really important conversation. My boss uh, serves as chairwoman actually of the Congressional EMP and GMD caucus and is the senior leader on the House Energy and Commerce and Homeland Security committees. In these roles, she has made a priority making sure our nation is prepared for the unimaginable. She's been leading that fight. And let me tell you, the issue of critical infrastructure resiliency, it has to be treated with the utmost urgency because the question of when a disruption of some nature will occur, it's not one of when. It's not one of if. It's gonna happen. We have to be prepared. If there's anything we've taken away from COVID-19, it should be that we must prepare for low probability but high impact events. Now, over the last year, I don't need to tell you guys, hundreds of thousands have died. Untold millions have lost their jobs, livelihoods destroyed. Americans we're suffering because we were not prepared for a pandemic. We all knew it could happen, it was a possibility, but that was tomorrow's problem. Well, we can't make that mistake again. Just a few weeks ago, the solar winds breach served as yet another painful reminder that our systems are vulnerable. It was a painful reminder that America's enemies, and boy, <laughs> do we have a few of them, they're always looking for new ways to strike. That's why we, we can't just take for granted that the electricity will always run, the water will always flow. It's up to us, all of us, to harden our systems and make them secure and resilient. The same can be said for the EMP, GMD, cyber, 
all these threats. The probability is low, but the consequences are so severe that we cannot afford inaction. Whatever the price tag is on resiliency, I assure you, the cost of doing nothing far exceeds it. Now, a GMD weather event, an EMP strike, think about it, it would lead to an extended duration, subcontinental scale power outage. Critical, infra critical infrastructure would fail. Hospitals, no electricity. Homes, no water. We're talking about a humanitarian catastrophe of the first order. Now, fortunately, Congress is aware of the risk, and we are working to address it. And wait for this, this one's gonna be a shocker, on a bipartisan basis. Last year, my boss actually introduced an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act, along with her Republican co-chair of the caucus, to require the Department of Defense to develop contingency plans in the event of any black sky hazard including an EMD, uh, EMP attack, uh, GMD weather event, uh, um, cyber attack with a critical infrastructure nexus, you name it. And the really exciting part was it passed the House, meaning it's in a great position to succeed in future NDAAs. Now, why is this so critical? Why should we be spending our time focusing on this? Well, as I see it, Congress has three really important roles to play in this regard. One, we have to raise awareness of black sky hazards generally by requiring federal agencies to analyze these threats, to reach out to the private sector and uh, coordinate and cooperate. We can help develop expertise within the government itself on how to prepare and respond. In a world of limited capacity, competing priorities, Congress has the power and it needs to use the power to direct attention and spotlight for important issues like this. Two, it's essential that we double down on our commitment to nonproliferation. Look, extending New START is a start, but it's not the whole ball game. Let's just talk North Korea. They have nukes, and you know, I think it's a safe assumption uh, they're not giving them up. Do we really think for a second they would hesitate to use them if the survival of the regime was at stake? I think not. Three, and this one's critical, we have to provide resources, folks, personnel, funding, to the agencies that can get this job done. Icing on the cake, the thing that ties all of this together, though, is that these investments, hardening our power grid, enhancing our cybersecurity, building redundant generation capacity, uh, expanding the talent pipeline, these have benefits far beyond just black sky hazard preparedness. We can create good paying jobs. We can protect the environment, combat climate change, and simultaneously protect against conventional cyber threats, state-sponsored hacking. We can do all that while also enhancing our national security against black sky hazards. None of this happens though without you. And I mean that literally, it's folks like you who are passionate about resiliency, who will make this happen. We need you in this fight, making your voice heard loud and clear that black sky hazards, they're not hypothetical textbook risks. They're real, they are serious. And the time to prepare was yesterday. And unfortunately, since yesterday is not an option, how about we start preparing today? That's what my boss is fighting for in Congress, and I am so thrilled that all of you are here fighting for it too. We can set policy, but without the engineers, the scientists, the national security professionals, the emergency planners, so many others who innovate on the front lines, who do the hard work of getting this job done, those policies are just words on a page. So again, Thank you guys so much for all you do, for taking the time to join us today during your busy schedules. And uh, just know uh, we're going to continue working hard, and no doubt you guys are too. So thank you. David, thank you very much for those comments. Um, obviously, we'll get, maybe getting back to you with Q&A toward the end. But again, 
uh, thank you for being with us. Our next speaker is Davidson Scott. Davidson is president of Electromagnetic Associates. And Davidson's been involved with EMP protection for quite some time. We've asked Davidson to basically characterize the EMP threat, but also give us the basics of where protection stands at this point. And he has to do it in 10 to 12 minutes. So no big deal, Davidson, but if anybody can do it, Davidson can. So Davidson, please proceed. Thanks, Frank, and, uh, and good morning to everybody. Um, I just wanted to cover electromagnetic threats and protection concepts here in this next uh, the, these few slides, just to uh, to help give everybody a little bit of context on um, on uh, what they're facing in terms of uh, if they're thinking about adding resiliency to their uh, enterprise organization. So, uh, really, the first thing you want to do is look at the the threats and um, and actually we just had a, uh, a, a an update to the uh, unclassified EMP waveforms out of the Department of Energy uh, last month, and uh, so there, there is a there, there's a, a little bit of a change there that can can impact a few folks, but um, by and large, at least for the E1, it's uh, it's it's relatively stable. But um, anyway, so so HAMP refers to a high altitude electromagnetic pulse, a nuclear device uh, uh, detonated at altitude. We've also got the uh, intentional electromagnetic interference threat. That's actually a broader threat, but we're looking at um, uh, those threats that uh, that uh, you know seek to damage uh, equipment and electronics. Um, and the third one is electromagnetic exploitation. That's sort of a tempest, tempest in uh, cyber uh, cyber threat, and and certain aspects of IEMI jamming and and other things. So. Uh, that that's what you're looking at uh, for, for the most part for the uh, electromagnetic threat um, uh, uh, landscape. This next slide, uh, if you're if you're just starting out or if you're uh, experienced in uh, you know EMP threat, you can't take two steps without tripping over this slide. So, um, but but I overlaid some some. Uh, just some context onto this uh, this slide, so you could can look at um, you know on the left side, you know where where do various standards and uh, and other typical um, uh, exposure scenarios, electromagnetic scenarios, fall, and at the bottom maybe some uh, some some sort of data processing context, and then um, you know in the uh, the upper left hand uh, quadrant there is sort of a Sort of a, an outline, rough outline on on where you're looking for uh, uh, potential for semiconductor upset or damage. Uh, put in the context of this of this slide, and there's a lot written about this slide, and I'd encourage you to uh, to dig that up and uh, and and study it in the context of what is important to your enterprise and your particular um, electromagnetic threat scenario. Next slide, thank you. Um, this is a this is a, a useful useful slide to uh, to give context. This is this is an unclassified um, chart from uh, Katie Lighthouser, and um, it, it basically shows that uh, if you look at the the yield of a nuclear device detonated at altitude, uh, it does not linearly track um, in terms of the the magnitude of the detonation versus the EMP that's generated. So, so this is this is important to know that um, you know some some people will say that uh, that that any nuke will do to to generate an EMP, and certainly that's uh, that's what that's the story that this chart chart, chart tells you. Uh, next one. This next one is uh, sort of shows you the uh, the the hemp pulse altitude versus the field, basically. Uh, depending on altitude, if the, the altitude covers the uh, uh, sets the, the the overall scope of the uh, of an electromagnetic pulse, if it can't see the 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 area that's effective affected, it's not going to affect it. So uh, basically, the higher you go, the larger the area, uh, as you would uh, would sort of expect. And and again, the the altitude. Is reasonably stable. It's not really linear from the standpoint of um, 
uh, of uh, generating a field, although it does start to tail off above 400 kilometers. Next slide. Um, and, and this slide shows basically the, the evolution of semiconductor technology. Um, and I, I can't remember where I got this slide. I apologize, but um, I would uh, I would like to reference it if I can find it. But um, but but the 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 story of this of this uh, slide is that as uh, semiconductor technologies evolve, as they always do, they get faster and dimensions get smaller. And um, as a result of that, you end up with um, breakdown voltages that end up decreasing and making them more susceptible to EMP. So, so the, the, even if you, you're not intending to become more uh, vulnerable to an EMP by going through various elect, uh, generations of electronics in your enterprise, you may be introducing um, additional EMP vulnerabilities without without knowing it and and that's the uh the the takeaway for this particular particular slide and and you just need to understand that in the context of what you've got in your enterprise so that uh you can uh you can come to a a uh a plan for what what to do in your case ultimately electromagnetic threats uh occur in two ways. One's a radiated threat and one's a conducted threat. And really they, they would have the same source in terms of a, uh, of, a, of, a, of a hemp event. They might be the same in terms of an IEMI or they may be uh, specifically um, targeted at uh, one versus the other. But um, uh, radiated emissions and conducted emissions can trade places pretty easily. So, so you might have a uh, a radiated emission that comes in contact with a cable and then couples to that cable and carries that energy along the conductor path. Um, by the same token, conducted emissions can can re-radiate once they go inside of a of a shield, and that's one of the reasons why. If you take an example of a uh, of a substation house for a uh, power utility, uh, you may have a great shield for radiated threats, but um, you've got to bring cables into the environment for the substation house to function and um and that that constitutes a problem and i think we're going to hear another presentation that that sort of uh deals with that specific scenario here in a little bit but um the bottom line is that you have to control both the radiated emissions you control with with effective shielding and the conducted emissions you control with filters and filtration and um, you know, just general uh, block and tackle uh, good engineering practices in designing shielded environments is or what you uh, what you need to to look at to reach whatever level of uh, electromagnetic um, uh, uh, field levels that you're that you're trying to target um, the uh, the 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 military standard targets uh, 80 dB which you can you can roughly Roughly uh, uh, calculate as as being in the neighborhood of uh, five volts per meter um, inside of a uh, conducted environment, but but you got to deal with radiated emissions and conducted emissions wherever you wherever you find them in order to uh, have an effective resilience uh, program. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, some people like to talk about putting things underground, and I just wanted to briefly. Um, uh, address that, and this this came from Carl. This next chart came from uh, I don't know Carl Baum's uh, repository with the uh, with the Suma folks, and um, that that um, if you could if you could change the next slide. This this gives us an you know, a uh, uh, a calculated um, uh, exposure of or, or the field levels that you could expect at uh, certain at certain depths uh, of um, uh, uh, underground and um, as you can see uh, and this applies to both uh, hemp and IEMI um, and I'll explain that in a second uh, hemp the and if you look at a GMD the lowest frequency levels really um, are not are not shielded that significantly 
by uh, nominal nominal soils and 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 that's the definition of nominal soils uh, three times ten to the minus third moles per meter. Um, you know, you know, there there is a quite a bit of variance in soils, but uh, but ultimately you got to draw the line somewhere, and um, uh, you know this is the nominal uh, model. Um, but uh, you know, you you get you get a little bit of shielding when you go below ground, but uh, ultimately um, as uh, you get higher in frequency, and of course a hemp pulse, uh, the the waveform is from 10 kilohertz to 1000 megahertz, one gigahertz. And um, at higher frequencies, the soils do a better job of, of absorbing that energy. And um, that's also true with IEMI, which are generally higher frequency, um, higher frequency uh, uh, threats. Those threats will, will, will be readily absorbed by, uh, by, by soil. So if you're building a facility by putting penetrations uh, 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 below grade or underground or in a vault can, can be quite an effective way of, um, of uh, uh, mitigating some of the, uh, the effects of, a, uh, of an IEMI or a, a, a hemp pulse in terms of the highest frequencies. So again, look at this in the context of, of your, your, uh, uh, your task ahead for resiliency, whether it's your enterprise, whether you're building a facility, Whatever you're doing, uh, this is a uh, this is an important consideration uh, for you to uh, to look at. Uh, basically, as I was saying, the high frequency components of a of an IEMI or a hemp are uh, attenuated by Earth to a certain extent. Higher the frequency, the more attenuation. Um, you you're still going to get conducted emissions if you um, have cables in conduit underground uh, uh, leading to a, a facility, whether it's above ground or below ground. Um, you know, if you're, if you're very close to a nuclear detonation, you're gonna have a, a, a low frequency uh, uh, issue that you don't have with IEMI or hemp um, in, in the, the classical threat scenario. And um, again, low frequency magnetic fields aren't affected by soils. And that's one of the reasons why a geomagnetic storm is so uh, uh, so concerning because it, uh, it it has fields that go hundreds of kilometers into the earth uh, and and creates a uh, a difference in ground potential, which is ultimately the source of a damaging uh, GIC. So, uh, next slide. This is just a slide. I'm not going to go into it too much, but uh, what I, what I, whatever you're planning to do. You should have some some expected uh, hemp inputs on the left side, and uh, on the right side are are risks to your your project. Should you should you not get those inputs or not deal with them, and um, it's a uh, it's basically a, uh, a a diagram that says, look, if you don't have somebody who understands this stuff, find someone. Whether it's someone in the EIS council, whether it's someone like me who has a little bit of experience uh, with facilities like this, uh, you, should, uh, you should reach out and find somebody who's done it or can help you understand what the, uh, what the threats are and what the actions that you can take to end up with a better result at the end. Uh, next slide. So that's all that I've got. Thank you very much for your time and uh, back to you, Frank. Okay, Davidson, thanks very much. Um, next, we're going to turn to Dr. Randy Horton. Randy is Senior Program Manager at EPRI. Uh, EPRI is Electric Power Research Institute, and EPRI conducts research on behalf uh, of the electric utilities. Now, we've asked Randy to kind of, you, Davidson kind of explain where we stand today in terms of kind of what we know and what we can apply to EMP protection. To ask Randy to kind of look into the future. Randy's actively engaged with research to uh, advance the knowledge on EMP. So we've asked Randy to uh, summarize for us what, what he's looking at for future study and what we'd expect to learn. So with Randy, turn it back to you. All right. Th th thank you, Frank. Um, so first of all, I want to thank uh, you and the EIS Council for giving me this opportunity to talk about what we're doing uh, in this space. I really appreciate uh, being here with you today. So next slide. 
So I am going to talk about kind of a little bit of the what we're doing now in future, but I think a good place to start is kind of uh, in the past. So the first thing I wanted to do is just kind of give you a high level overview of what we found in our uh, first phase of research, which was from April 16 to April 19, where we published the, the final report in April of 2019, because it gives some context of why we're doing some of the things that we're, we're doing now. So as we went through that three-year process, we found that um, as we looked at the, the different components that, that um, Davidson mentioned, as we looked at these separate components as well as combined components, uh, of a hemp event on the transmission system. You can think of that as the bulk electric system, all the transmission lines, basically the switch yards of the generators and the substations. Uh, we found some interesting things. First of all, we found that uh, E1 could damage uh, substation electronics and the damage could be over large areas based on uh, the particular environments that we looked at. Uh, we looked at E2 and because of the uh, inherent nature of the transmission system to protect it against lightning. We didn't see really any impacts from E2 because of the field levels are so low. When we looked at E3 by itself, we found that you could have regional voltage collapse. And when I say regional, it's still a very large area. You could think in terms of 2003 blackout type of, type of area. Uh, but because of the short duration of the event, unlike a GMD event, uh, transformer damage was assessed to be uh, limited. And But when we looked at both of these together, E1 plus E2 plus E3, we found that you could find yourself in a regional voltage collapse and have E1 damage. So when you think of that in, in terms of uh, system recovery, essentially you would be in a blackout scenario, um, but your system recovery efforts would be uh, impeded because of the E1 damage. Also, there's lots of uncertainty as you know, with regards to what that specific damage would be in a real system. So the, the, in a nutshell, instead of, you know, the recovery being maybe days or a week, which would be the case in a, in a typical blackout scenario, it could be weeks or, or longer because of the potential E1 damage. So the, the, the key thing, and I guess before I get into that, the other thing is part of that research, we did identify some options and tested some of those in the lab. Uh, and they seem to, to mitigate the, the e, uh, E1 impacts that we were seeing. So the, sort of the whole linchpin in this thing was that E1 was key and E1 mitigation is needed. But before uh, we went out as an industry and did mass deployment of these uh, mitigation options, uh, more work was needed, primarily to kind of work out the details to determine what specifically needed to be done. Uh, in, in modern substation designs, because if you think about working on the power grid, it's kind of like working on an airplane while it's in flight. Uh, you wouldn't want to do something that would, would cause uh, uh, unintended consequences and things like that. So a lot of effort uh, we felt like needed to, be, to, to go into that. Next slide. So to kind of identify some of those uh, issues as well as look and see what specifically needed to be done um, from from an EMP hardening perspective on specific substation designs, we developed this project and kicked it off about the same time we were putting out the final report. And at, at probably mid-year, I guess, in 2019, we had uh, 19 utilities uh, sign up for this project where we're doing pilot projects for specific substation uh, substations across the contiguous United States. And for that project, uh, we're doing very detailed assessments of those specific substation designs. Some are greenfield sites, some are brownfield sites. And so what we're able to do is, is through modeling and testing is assess the specific impacts to that design. And then based on those impacts, we can uh, develop specific mitigations uh, for those substation designs that can protect up to 50 kV per meter uh, threat level. And then based on those designs, we work with the utilities, we get them installed, we do additional testing to evaluate their efficacy. And then through this process, we're also developing uh, cost data uh, and, uh, and obviously sharing of lessons learned uh, uh, you know, through this process. So it's so a very important project of kind of working out what the details are, also improving how we're doing these assessments uh, and so on. And just for your information, if you weren't aware of this, through this process, we're also making 
uh, publicly available for free, kind of an update every so often on what's going on in this project. So the, the document you see there to the right, as well as the link, you can go there and download. It's about an eight page white paper that kind of describes what we're doing, why we're doing it, and kind of some, you know, uh, quick quick learnings from what's going on as well as sort of uh, what we have in view envisioned for the future with regards to uh, additional research so that's so that's a big uh, portion of what we have uh, going on right now next slide and so going through um, obviously our first phase of our research project but as well as getting into more of the details of some of these additional uh, substation assessments you know we'll go out in the field and you know do multiple uh, shielding effectiveness testing of control buildings, for example, or, or assessing and modeling 19 different substations uh, and the specific designs for those, we're, we're learning a lot. So what I've put together here is kind of a listing of some of the things, and I sort of see this more as, a, as industry needs, um, and, and I'll quickly talk about kind of what we're doing to, to help in that space. So the first is, as you're doing, this is particularly true for E1 assessments as well as E3 assessments is having high fidelity uh, hemp environments to use for assessments. And what I mean by high fidelity, you know, if you, if you pull up the IEC standards, you basically get a threat level and a waveform. And when you're doing these assessments, particularly when you don't know where the ground zero locations can be, it's very important to know what the polarization of the fields are, what the angles of incidence are, uh, how the E-field waveforms change with location uh, on the ground, and so all those details matter a lot when you start looking at impacts. So, um, you know, we, we work with, uh, with our federal partners to try to make more and more of that information available and also, um, uh, basically just provide additional training or not training, but just kind of from an educational perspective, just make people aware that that, that is a need as, as the industry goes off, uh, and does these studies, that's going to be a, a need that's, uh, that's there. The other part of that, you have the environment that kind of feeds into the modeling and testing as well. Uh, but from a simulation modeling simulation perspective, there's not really any commercially available tools available to do plane wave coupling, for example, uh, from an E1 perspective outside of, uh, you know, 3D, uh, you know, FEM type of tools. So one of the things we've, we've tried to do as a part of this research is develop additional software tools that people can use to begin to, to model and simulate these effects. Uh, there's a lot more work that needs to be done in that area. Equipment testing, you know, we've done a lot of work with regards to testing uh, digital protective relays and other devices, but uh, as we get into some of the other aspects of this problem, like distribution equipment, for example, uh, there's we're finding that there's always some type of equipment that needs to be tested. Um, you know, in some in some cases, tests were done. Uh, you know, back in the 80s, early 90s, but you know, we're finding that there's a lot of additional testing that still needs to be done to kind of quantify what the potential impacts might be on on the modern power system. A quick example of that would be, uh, you know, what are the potential impacts of a conducted threat or even a radiated threat to, uh, to a PV inverter? You know, there's just not been a lot of work done in that space. So we're seeing that as a need. And then also just techniques for performing assessments, which is kind of, uh, part of the modeling and testing piece, but just developing new ways to do assessments and, and how to include risk in that so that you're not necessarily looking at the worst case impacts of the worst case thing. Uh, and then also always exploring uh, additional mitigation options. So as we get into looking at these problems, we're gonna find that there are better ways to mitigate these threats and, and also in a more cost effective manner. Um, so those are the kind of the areas that, uh, that our R&D is currently focusing on as well as we'll be focusing on uh, in the future. Uh, next slide. So lastly, just, our, you know, our first report really primarily focused on the transmission system because there was a lot of um, work that needed to be done in that area specifically, and it was a great place to start. But obviously, you know, how two DMP events don't discriminate, doesn't just focus on the, on the transmission system. So. Uh, we're now looking at, uh, and have been probably for the last six to nine months, I guess, starting to look at some of these different areas like telecom systems, uh, distribution systems, and also generating facilities. Some of these areas, we're also uh, working with our uh, federal partners, for example, Department of Energy on, on some of this. But the big takeaway is 
We're continuing to work on the transmission substation projects, but we're also beginning to look at uh, other areas that are also critical uh, to that bulk electric system uh, function, such as telecom systems, distribution, and, and generation as well. So we'll, uh, I would say over the next two to three years, there will be a lot more work coming out uh, with regards to those as well. And as a part of that, we'll be able to leverage a lot of what we're learning um, from the substation work, which will, I think, translate directly into some of these other areas. So that's that's all I have. Okay, Randy, thanks very much. We appreciate that. Um, our last speaker is Kevin Bryant. Now, I should mention here that Eric Easton was uh, originally scheduled to do this, and Eric got called away to do a meeting with the, with his PUC in Texas. So thankfully, uh, Kevin Bryant was available to pinch hit for Eric. Uh, Kevin and Eric led a team at Center, Center Point Energy that developed some really innovative solutions to EMP protection. Um, we basically, uh, holding out Center Point Energy is a success story in that uh, I think they have demonstrated what can be accomplished with organizational commitment and te technical expertise. So uh, Kevin, thanks again for doing this and pinch hitting for Eric and uh, please proceed. Thank you, Frank, and uh, thank you uh, for the EIS uh, Council to uh, set up this meeting. Uh, I think it's really informative to um, bring this topic out. Uh, just a little quick background of Centerpoint. We serve 2.4 million customers. We have uh, over 230 substations, both at the transmission and distribution level. And uh, our service area is a 5,000 square mile area in and, in and around Houston. Next slide. When we were looking at EMP solutions, we wanted to look at all of the different threats, including HEMP, IEMI, and GMD. Next slide. So we, we contemplated two designs, a, a new control house design, which for us would be a 20 foot by 32 foot design, all the way up to a 20 foot to 88 foot design, which would be our typical control house. And then we also, um, came up with the idea of a compact EMP module design, which would be a four foot by four foot design. We really liked this retrofit concept idea, so we started looking into this design. Next slide. So these decisions didn't come overnight. Um, we started in, uh, we finished our control, our Harding Control Center in 2015. We took a lot of our lessons learned from that project and then we also were researching digital substation and in 2017 uh, we started the design and fabrication of the EMP module. Next slide. So there are two main components of the EMP module design which is the main enclosure which would hold your main relays, your um, switches and RTUs and other uh, major components, as well as out in the yard would be your merging unit, which would convert your analog signals to digital signals um, out in the yard. Next slide. So here's a basic application of how the EMP module would work and how it would, would be protect for an EMP event. Um, the red or the red and orange arrows are uh, simulate a, a EM wave and the module and the merging unit enclosures are a six-sided enclosure, hardened enclosure that would protect for any radiated energy. For the power supply, as you see in the bottom right, uh, where there, there's a battery, it feeds F1, which is a hemp filter, which powers the module. And then at the same time, besides powering the relays inside the module, yeah, the power also leaves another hemp filter, F2, which uh, goes out through a cable management system, R1, through shielded cable all the way out to R2, which is another cable management system, and then powers the merging unit. At the same time, to protect for other conducted energy that is reflected through the instrument transformers, we have a surge suppression that protects the merging unit. Next slide. So he, here are a couple pictures during fabrication. Uh, during the fabrication, uh, we were able to do a number of tests. Uh, some of the tests include IEEE 299, which is a shielding effectiveness 
test. Also, uh, we tested, uh, since we're having a lot of electronics in a closed shielded cabinet, we did a noise emission test and that went uh, very well, no, no issues there. And also uh, we uh, did a thermal model. Next slide. So once we were completed with uh, fabrication, we did a, a full field RS-105 uh, test with a 50 kV pulse. Um, as you can kind of see in the middle picture, that's the waveform uh, of the 50 kV pulse. And then um, in red below is showing the what was inside the module, which is pretty much just a noise. Uh, there was really no uh, energy that uh, came into the module. So that was a success as well as we did direct injection testing on the merging unit to make sure um, it would pass any conducted energy. And then at the same time, we were doing uh, testing the digital protection with uh, to make sure it was able to clear the fault events. Next slide. So once we're comfortable with those results, we installed it at one of our existing substations. Um, this module can uh, replace 16 traditional relay panels um, all into one enclosure. Um, the only thing we had to change when we did the installation was to make a larger door to help with installation. What we realized is what we really didn't need to increase the size of the door, the module would fit without um, increasing the door, but it did help with installation uh, a little bit. Next slide. Here's a close up of the merging unit. Um, the top picture shows uh, the, in blue the cable management system. In the bottom left picture is uh, pictures of the cert suppression as well as the terminal blocks and test switches. And in the bottom right is the installed unit out in the yard. Next slide. So we operate the EMP module parallel to our existing protection and control equipment. Um, we leave the trip and close links open to lower our operational risk, but they're tested and uh, we can close it, we can close in and operate at any time if we need to use the EMP module. Next slide. So as we were doing exploring the different options of which way we wanted to go, we, uh, we were really looking into a new control house um, but at the same time, we had some experience with building new control houses due to flooding issues as well and other and other and fires as well. So um, one of the things we learned from those installations is there's it takes a long time to convert from an existing house to a control house. I think as Randy mentioned, it's it's kind of like a moving plane. You you can't just turn it off and uh, you know the power needs to be served into those areas. So um, you really have to move one panel by, at a time and there's a lot of uh, outage and um, coordination that needs to be done. And sometimes this process could take uh, years to, to move from one control house to another. Uh, another. Another thing uh, that's shown on the bottom, the number of surge and uh, new cables that are needed to complete this installation. So this, these were definitely um, things on our top of, top of the mind when we uh, were looking at different approaches. Next slide. So when we looked at the module, we really liked the fact that we could drop in the module to the existing control house and uh, we could leave the existing protection and controls intact. Also, uh, the number of uh, fiber optic cables and shielded control cables are very limited and the surge suppression can be installed out in the merging unit cabinets, which are out in the yard. So it's a very clean installation and quick installation. And we uh, and that's that's kind of why we continued this approach. Next slide. So we also wanted to take into account not just the initial cost, but the whole life cycle of one of the items we learned from our control center was uh, the all the specialized uh, initial and and annual testing that we had to do to make sure that our equipment was working and shielded properly. And with, with the module approach, um, we can test a lot of the equipment at the factory 
And when we install it, we uh, eliminate a lot of the testing as well as being a smaller component, we, we really cut down a lot on the maintenance cost. Next slide. And this is just a, a diagram of all the different options we were looking at and we were putting together kind of a cost analysis of, of all the different uh, mitigations that we could do and seeing how effective they are and how much they would cost. If we go to the next slide, uh, this is this is a, uh, we priced out all of these options and uh, we, we tried to see, okay, what was the best option? Um, as you can see in the, the second line from the top uh, is our EMP module, which, which shows that it's the least expensive out of all the options, but also um, is the most, is very effective at uh, HEMP and IMI. Um, you can look at the other, uh, approaches and you could you could see that you could also spend a lot of money but not be that effective so uh, we, we were really looking at all of our options and then in the bottom chart was the life cycle cost um, you know as I mentioned on the previous slide that the maintenance cost over a 20-year period can really add up if you have a lot of components and a lot of testing so by keeping our module smaller and uh, the doors and all the equipment not being used as much, we could really cut down on our maintenance cost. Next slide. So the deployment strategy we're working on is covering our priority stations, but we like the module approach because we could also uh, move around the modules in case there's damage in other areas. So uh, with, a, with a fixed installation, you spend all the money into one substation, and if if you don't if you don't need it at that substation, or your your system topology changes, it would be hard to move around. So we, we really like the module approach where we could deploy it and uh, move it to other stations if necessary. Next slide. So in conclusion, we uh, looked at both approaches of a new control house versus the EMP module. We ultimately chose the EMP module because it gives us a compact and cost-effective solution. And it also does not jeopardize the current protection and control systems that our field personnel are accustomed to. Uh, that's all I had and uh, thank you everyone for your time and attention. Kevin, thanks again for uh, doing the presentation for us. Um, thank you. We've got a few minutes for Q&A, and I guess I wanted to explore this topic of, of organizations that are contemplating doing EMP protection. And Kevin, since you're up there and on a roll, um, what, what was the secret sauce at, at the Center Point Energy for getting this done? How did the team come together? Um, what are the kind of skills that are necessary to pull this off? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I would say just thinking outside the box um, and having our upper management being on board with uh, with e with hardening for EMP um, in 20. You know, as I mentioned, we started in 2010 with our control center and they, you know, they were really supportive and they really wanted us to find a solution. And after the learning, after our experience with Control Center, um, it was really trying to find a cost-effective solution. Uh, you know, we we looked at the new control house, and um, you know, we worked with other utilities, and you know, that was a very costly method, and it kind of discouraged people. So I think really finding the cost-effective approach is going to be helpful for the industry. Thanks, uh, Davidson. Your your experience. You've worked with a lot of different organizations. How do you how do you assess an organization organization's readiness to kind of take this on? What what are the key factors you think? You're muted, Davidson. Yep. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. Um, you know, a few things that uh, that uh, that come to mind. Um, you know, for, first of all, really, it is an education uh, uh, sort of a thing, and and you know, uh, Kevin was underlying the education through uh, hard knocks, beating your head against the wall, trying to get it done, and um, 
um, I had the opportunity to work with uh, some of the center point folks on some of the control house stuff. And um, uh, it, they, they were the only ones doing it at the time. Um, and, uh, uh, but, but the education part, there's a lot of information out there for folks that are, they're trying to figure out what to do. And, um, uh, but, but there's a lot of information that, uh, that you need to sort through, you know, as a, for instance, um, you know, it keeps coming back that, uh, that a solar storm uh, can destroy electronics. There's products that you can buy that will protect your electronics from a solar storm, when the reality is a solar storm isn't going to burn out your electronics. It's going to be very serious, but it's in a different way. Um, another example of, of education is, um, is uh, there are even some, some standards put out by, by, uh, by government agencies that uh, that tell you to do things like put um, electronics in a microwave oven as an expedient Faraday cage, um, uh, and and that doesn't work. So there are, there are um, it's not just education; it's getting the right information. And um, you know, I really think that uh, that it it helps folks to reach out, find somebody who's done it, find somebody in another utility, talk to the EIS council find folks that have, uh, that have that have actually accomplished something similar to what you're trying to do and then um, use that to to build on uh, making a plan to to take some action. Thanks Davidson. David, you also talked about education and, and resources and all. Um, does the government have a role to play here? Can the government direct people or help people to uh, get to the information that they need to try to tackle this problem? Do you see any a role there for the government. Absolutely. Look, uh, that's a lot of what uh, the amendment I mentioned in my remarks earlier does. It builds expertise within the government and then that expertise can be disseminated. It is so important that the facts are correct and the word gets out. There's a million issues uh, of the day, but we need to make sure this is one of them. Mm -hmm. Good, thanks. Randy, I want to turn to you. I guess uh, you have worked with, were you working with a large uh, portion of the electric industry in the US um, and have done this for quite some time. What, how do you assess the level of interest and, and how is that changing as time goes on in your, your research project? Yeah, so I would say the level of interest was you know, high when we started in, in April of 16, and I would, I've would only seen it increase. I mean, the fact that we've got 19 utilities that are actually installing EMP mitigation, I think kind of speaks to the level of interest. But getting back to Davidson's point, I think a big part of this is, is education. And one of the things that utilities are worried about is one of the things we found in our research, and that is, you know, as you talk about this in general terms and the broad, um, uh, audiences, there's this notion that if, you know, if, if cost were no, uh, you know, if cost were not an issue, we could just go out and implement mill standard 188, 125 and all the substations, which sounds great because it's all worked out. But when you start looking at the details, for example, uh, you know, installing hemp filters in series with protection and control circuits, particularly the voltage and current circuits that go into relays, it doesn't work right. That, you know, it can cause other potential issues. So it's just kind of like working through all those details. Uh, but I think the interest is there. Uh, the utilities just, just want to make sure that what what they do to harden against how 2 DMP is not going to cause some ancillary uh, impact. Um, mm -hmm. And I think once we get those details worked out, which I would argue we're basically there now, um, you'll see this uh, start to be done in a much broader fashion. Great. Well, guys, thanks very much. Uh, again, appreciate you all being available and making the presentations for us. Uh, for those who can hang on for the forum session, that's great. Um, and I want to mention, I guess, a number of questions have already come in during this one hour presentation. So even though we've subjected the, the listeners here to, I'll say, a drink from the fire hose on, on EMP, we've gotten a number of questions. We'll try to tackle some of them in the forum session to follow. Um, but again, thanks uh, for, to the speakers. And John, I want to turn it back to you for any kind of final wrap up. Hey, Frank, thanks for a great job facilitating. And gentlemen, outstanding.
so much great information in there. Uh, let me just wrap up very quickly. As Frank mentioned, the forum will follow in about 15 minutes. Uh, here is the link on this slide, but I also put the link into the uh, chat room. So if you want to just go hit that, you can register and we'll get started in about 15 minutes. A few, a few uh, final points. Uh, if you're part of this community and you're interested in being a partner or a sponsor, uh, please feel to reach out to us at uh, info at eiscouncil.org and we'll be happy to pull you in and make you part of the team. Uh, such a tremendous group of uh, network affiliates that we're pulling together. So if you're interested in becoming a partner or sponsoring one of our events, uh, just let us know and we'll we'll work with you closely. I'm very excited to uh, to bring to conclusion today something we've been working on for well over 18 months. Uh, effective today, you can get the latest EPRO Handbook version 4, EMP Best Practices and Cost-Effective Solution uh, for Electric Utilities. The link on this slide is live. Uh, you can also Google that title at uh, Amazon or search on Amazon and you'll be able to find that. And uh, I want to highlight that this effort uh, took many, many months, lots and lots of uh, subject matter expertise brought to bear. And it was done primarily with the, the support from the Newton and Rochelle Becker Charitable Trust and the Goodman Family Foundation, and then some of our other partner foundations that just support our work. But uh, that's available today on Amazon. It'll be available in soft cover soon, uh, but uh, realize that that's out there today. And I think if you're interested in this field, this is going to be one of the one of the master source books for this kind of work going forward. I do want to talk a little bit about another document that will be coming out. Uh, Frank actually leads one of our critical infrastructure resilience groups. They've put about a year into building the resilience guidelines for the electric industry, specifically for Black Start. So we'll be publishing that and releasing it in February. Stay tuned, look for emails from us, and we'll make sure that you, you're aware of it. Our next GRCOM webinar will be in just about a month on the 24th of February, same start time. This one is going to be on energy resilience. We're going to talk about the critical actions that are required. And uh, we will also have a follow on energy resilience forum. And if people want to participate in that or be a sponsor, let us know. The link at the bottom is live. And so you can use that to register in advance. I do want to make note of one thing. We have had a number of questions come in. The slides from today's event and the video link will be published as soon as they're rendered. And then in about a week, we will send out a set of notes from this session. And the material that was presented today was so incredibly great, uh, we may even try to release a couple of articles on this. I want to talk a little bit here as we close out on the Global Resilience Commission. I'm going to encourage you to join us and be part of the team. Um, the Global Resilience Framework is something that we envisioned early on last year. We now have the concept coming in, uh, into focus, and it's going to be met with a, a sister document called the Global Resilience Notebook. We are going to take on the initial black sky hazards and then evolve into the broader resilience effort. But if you're interested in resilience or you're interested in the critical infrastructure impacts uh, from any of the black sky hazards, please let us know. Send us a note at info at EIS Council. We are going to stand up a number of work groups that are going to work in this area, and we'd love to have your participation and your feedback. One last note down here on the lower left-hand corner, we are now prominently working within LinkedIn. So if you're a member of LinkedIn, reach out to the EIS Council and you will be able to find us easily. And you'll also be able to find out our team of, uh, of sector coordinators in Lincoln with us. We love to share information with everybody going forward. And so that concludes the GRCOM session for today. Again, my name is John Heltzel. We're gonna take a short break. We'll kill this session and then we will bring up the forum. I hope you'll take advantage, join us. It's gonna be lively, a little bit more loose than what we did today. A couple of really great presentations on additional solutions you can think about. But in uh, all cases, be careful out there, be safe, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you all very much.